A question few have dared to ask, what is the connection between a local mosque and the recruiting of young people for terrorism? Tom Lydon first broke the story of the missing young men nearly three years ago. And now he's here to connect some more of the dots. A lot of dots, obviously. And, you know, these hearings are very controversial. I'm just not quite sure they've answered the real question that we had going into this, which was how were these young people radicalized to begin with before the actual recruiting even began? How do you take a teenager, for example, and convince him it's his duty as a good Muslim to fight and maybe die for a country he may not even remember? Tonight, the perspective of a man who has seen both sides of the holy war. For any religion, there is that line between faith and intolerance, separating the peaceful from the radicalized and violent extreme. And they were telling us that one day we will take over the whole world. This man we'll call Marcel has crossed that line before. When he was only 16, he was recruited for jihad, a holy war in Somalia. Uh, I was involved with the mother organization. Trained by Al-Qaeda for a group that would later become known as Al-Shabaab. In the training camp, there were religious lectures at night, terrorism class by day. They were like a mystery to us. And then in the morning, they were our teachers teaching us everything from hand grenade to making all kind of bombs. That was in the early 90s when Somalia was beginning its long road into anarchy. Injured and disillusioned, Marcel would find his way, like thousands of other Somali refugees, to Minnesota, where he married and settled down to raise a family. On weekends, sending his three young sons to Abu Bakr Asadiq Islamic Center in South Minneapolis to keep them away, he thought, from drugs and gangs. But slowly at first, almost imperceptibly, his sons came home with a familiar refrain that had spoken to him before. Is America our country, our enemy, or our ally? And how do we know that, Dad? When your children approach you and they ask you these kind of questions, the parent will be left only to wonder, what, what am I going to do about my children? Did you say to your kids, where are you coming up with that? I asked my children, where are they coming that with? And they pointed to several lectures by Sheikh Mohammed Umar. This is Mohamed Umal, a controversial and charismatic religious leader based in Kenya. It's one of Umal's numerous lectures from Nairobi, delivered via satellite, beamed directly to Abu Bakr in Minneapolis. The Fox 9 investigators recovered this recording from a teenager's iPod. This particular lecture is on Muslims living among infidels. In Somali, Umal says, an average human being cannot be a spectator in life. Either you are with the righteous people or you are with the non-believers. What we need is the average Muslim to be true to what he has in his heart. That is to be with the righteous against the evil people. He's a radical to the bone. Abdi Bihi is a community leader who has long warned that some of the so-called scholarly lectures at Abu Bakr were not just divisive, but dangerous. Nothing short of a call to action. For young people hearing news from Somalia, the Ethiopian troops were invading their home country, raping women and children. This guy is building the fundamental beliefs of this community or this young people and telling them this is how you have to build the fundamentals. He's laying down the bricks of radicalization. That's his job. This iPod belongs to a Minneapolis teenager who vanished nearly three years ago, presumably to go fight in Somalia. He's still missing, and his parents don't wish to be identified, but they say for years he attended religious school here at Abu Bakr, and they believe this is where he downloaded the lectures. The iPod mixes the innocent and the insidious. Children's cartoons like this one, telling the story of Mohammed. Well, you raised him. But also dozens of podcasts from Anwar al alaki Al-Qaeda's notorious leader in Yemen. Since the death of Osama bin Laden, he now tops the FBI's most wanted list and the CIA's assassination list. Misinterpretation of our holy book. And that's what we have to deal with. Behe believes the iPod is an indoctrination tool, similar to techniques used to manipulate his own nephew, Burhan Hassan, who attended youth programs at Abu Bakr and also listened to Al-Alaki's lectures before leaving Minneapolis in November of 2008, 
to join al-Shabaab in Somalia. Burhan was killed by al-Shabaab, his family believes, when he became too sick to fight. Travel itineraries show many of the missing young men first traveled to Kenya, where they reportedly would stay or visit Nairobi's renowned Sixth Street Mosque. Its religious leader, none other than Mohammed Umal. And after two years, after many guys like him here, building this piece, that piece, that piece, that piece, they're ready. He's going to welcome them in his mosque in 6th Street, where Al-Shabaab will take them to Somalia. Despite repeated requests, no leaders from Abu Bakr were willing to talk to the Fox 9 investigators. And some of those attending prayer were less than eager for us to ask questions. <laughs> it's not. In Abu Bakr's lobby, there's now a sign warning against recruiting at the mosque. According to a federal indictment, Abdullahi Farah was doing just that. Known as Smiley, the Minneapolis cab driver was a recruiter for al-Shabaab, conducting teleconferences with the group at a mosque believed to be Abu Bakr. Among those he recruited, Farah Balidi, a former gang member known as Bloody. Two months ago, he lived up to his name, blowing himself up at a checkpoint in Somalia, killing himself and three others. The explosive trigger still visible in his camouflage jacket. Belidi was once a volunteer for youth programs at Abu Bakr. Ironically, Belidi was even a speaker at Abu Bakr during a mosque open house a few years ago, held after yet another man who attended the mosque, Sherwa Ahmed, became the first American suicide bomber, killing 22. It was that event three years ago that finally caught the attention of the FBI. You hit it on the head uh, when you said they could, in fact, do the same type of activity here in our country, and that is of great concern to us. Whether it's the lone wolf syndrome, uh, that is a problem that we try to stay on top of. Donald Oswald is the new man in charge for the Minneapolis office of the FBI, brought in specifically for his counterterrorism background. He says agents could follow the money trail, but the trail of ideology is more elusive. The First Amendment is a right that we all deserve here and that they have the right of freedom of religion. So uh, to be able to have those satellite uh, uh, episodes is certainly within their rights in this country. Generally speaking, they have the right to, uh, uh, to worship as they, uh, as they see fit and believe in the ideology that they believe until they cross over the line. But Marcel believes that line has already been crossed. He took his own children out of Abu Bakr two years ago. He doesn't want them listening to religious leaders who would have them following his own footsteps into jihad. They can say whatever they want, and they are not afraid of any repercussions. And the mosque is using this as a, as easy way to radicalize our young children without being responsible, without leaving any paper trail. This has also become a controversial in issue inside Abu Bakr itself, which in the last few months has moderated the tone and tenor of its lectures. Earlier this month, we told you Minneapolis police were called to break up a fight at Abu Bakr after some young people accused the mosque of turning its back on Somalia. Finally, it's important to point out federal prosecutors believe the suspects indicted for recruiting were acting as individuals, as proxies for al-Shabaab, and not representing the mosque itself. Although this is a very complicated, nuanced investigation, and it continues today. Yeah, a lot of pieces of the web there. Absolutely. And a lot of bravery, too, on behalf of this father, stepping forward and trying to make change. People believe it's important in the Somali community to come forward. They also say there is a lot of intimidation, though, in the community. Mm -hmm. They feel that. People saying, you know, don't come forward. Don't bring the spotlight on the Somali community, but many people believe it is important to get these issues out. Yeah. Jeez, a few Cultural bad people thing. can make it well, so tough. Well, we have to emphasize, else. obviously, it is a wonderful community that has right. benefited the Twin Cities enormously, and these are just a few people. A few bad people. Yeah, we know you'll follow it up. Thank you, Absolutely. Tom. Absolutely. All right, thanks.